Hi, everyone. Welcome to Metaphysical. Have you ever wondered if mysterious creatures really lurk deep in the ocean? Do ancient underwater structures uncover information about lost civilizations of the past? And what in tarnation is really at the bottom of Lake Tahoe? Well, to hear all about the water weirdness, join remote viewer John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. And I've got to ask, if you are listening to us, podcast, watching us on video, please leave us a five-star rating and review to help us reach even more people here. And if you are watching, please like and subscribe wherever you're watching us. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. John, how you doing? Good. I love water. I drink it every day. <laughs> you know, I think water is a crystalline substance, actually, isn't it? It's a crystal. Well, it's a crystal, uh, well, I mean, right? to some extent it is. I mean, look what happens to it when it freezes, right? Right. So, is it liquid crystals? Is that what it is? I mean, that's what that's what I've made up in my head about it. But why, <laughs> but why do you say that it's crystal? Like what what made I you? Know, I just made it up. I don't know. Oh. I, I, I just I was really wishing you didn't make it up and that there was something behind that because ice really does uh, look like crystals. I, I honestly like I think it's a it's a form of crystal. It's a form of crystal. Like, I, I don't know. Is this true? Is this something that I just made up? I think it might be something I made up. <laughs> Have you heard of Dr. Uh, Emoto, right? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Emoto, uh, Japanese, um, I don't know, is he a scientist or some type of scientist? Yes, he's a scientist. Yeah. He, he's a scientist. He did some amazing research on water, um, testing how it would freeze when you um, spoke to it in different ways. And or yelled at it. Or yelled at it, or were very kind and loving towards it, and what it would do to the water was amazing and it showed it proved and, and a, a lot of people denying this are saying that it doesn't prove anything but really if you look at this it proves that our our state our energy behind things ha has some type of manifest it manifests uh, you know to the things that we're that we're treating and um and around uh i mean look at this like truth eternal wisdom yeah uh, the compassion one looks really beautiful and then i mean look what happens when you make me sick evil um you know you fool like these things like it i mean wow really it, it changes the water massively he was attacked heavily oh, heavily big time for doing this like you know i mean so many people calling him a quack you know i think i think he was a scientist and, um, you know, when you're a scientist and you start publishing stuff like this, you get majorly attacked by the gatekeepers <laughs> of science. But, you know? you know, what's what's really bothers me about this is everybody in science knows that like their whole argument is that you should never um, attack someone and things should be brought through the scientific method. Right. And yet, and yet, when scientists go through that process and bring things up that are new, the way that it gets handled in that community is to attack and to criticize someone's character, even before looking at the research, so that people don't look at it for some it's, strange it's reason. It's all about the ad hominem attack. And it, like, yeah. I mean, look at yeah, and look what's going on with, uh, or what's been going on with Graham Hancock and, and a number of other people that have tried to bring forth a different narrative right. on what could have potentially happened. Well, I was watching an interview with Graham Hancock, and in the interview, I think it was on a Joe Rogan podcast. And, and in that interview, they brought in um, a geologist. I don't know his name. Yeah, and, I watched this. You sent right. that to me, right? One yeah. of his first statements was, I'm trying to protect the public from your ideas. I'm trying to protect the public from your ideas. What this says to me is that there are a lot of people who perceive themselves as being the, the high priest, the gatekeeper, Right. It gets very dogmatic. It does. And and if you present ideas that go against whatever they've got going or mainstream, then you are shut down with negative, basically ad hominem attacks. I mean, 
you know, the Smithsonian Institution even did that to um, Scott Walter on the Batcave Creek Stone, where he presented it on a television show that he had, America Unearthed. And Smithsonian said, you're not basically not a real researcher. You, sh you know, that's all there is to it. So it's really about like, like attacking a person's character and what they aren't. You are not one of us, so you can't speak of it. Yeah, and you know that... Um that show called America Unearthed was really popular and it ended up getting thrown out after a couple of seasons because right. he was kind of saying what he thought about the Smithsonian. Exactly. Why, why can't people say something about this? I don't get it. Why, you know, well, I mean, you know, you know, the Powell doctrine, right? The um, John Wesley Powell, who was, he was the first, uh, he ran the USGS created, the USGS, U.S. Geological Survey. He was uh, an explorer of the American West, right, in the late 1800s. Um, and he was the first director of the Bureau of Eth Ethnology for the Smithsonian Institution. Mm -hmm. And when he was the director, he basically, he came up with a decree. And this was pointed out by John Dewhurst, who wrote the book, Ancient Giants Who Ruled America. Yeah, Great I remember book. that book. Yeah, yeah. so basically in, in, in Powell's decree, it said that, um, no anthropological research should consider any talk of lost tribes henceforth while also describing natives as uncultured, savage, and lacking signs of higher intellect. And then he says, hence it will be seen that it is illegitimate to use any pictographic matter of a date anterior to the discovery of the continent by Columbus for historic purposes. Okay, so what, what he's, yeah, so what, what Powell decreed here was that you are not to look at anything, go after anything, do research on things that would upset the, the, the idea Narrative. that there was anything before Columbus came here, except for Native Americans. So, so, so that became Smithsonian policy in general. And what that did was it shut down research, number one, into the giants, right? Um, because that would have been a date anterior to Columbus supposedly discovering this place. It also shuts down this whole discussion about um, hieroglyphs or ancient other ancient alphabets that show up across America. You're not, you just can't go after it. You can't do it. I mean, I, I found, I found myself in my explorations, some ancient carvings on the California coast. I have photographs of them too. And these are ancient, ancient carvings. And we had remote viewed them. Like, was it a geologic process or was it something carved? No, it was not something um, that was a geologic process. It was something that was used in rituals. And I found these things. And they were like, it took me like, I probably hiked like 12 miles to get to them. And, and we, I had followed remote viewing data, right? Because our remote viewing data said this stuff was out there. And, and when I got photographs and I wanted to present it to somebody who was in on the research on the um, more archaeology, geology side, at first, when they saw it, they were very interested. I'm like, whoa, where, what is this? Where did you find this? You know, these, these really appear to be carvings. And then when I said, they said, no, no, they can't be carvings because um, nobody um, carved back then here in California. And they're a geologic process. Right. So there's the barrier right there. There's the barrier where where you can't go. You have to take in. They have to take into understanding what they think they know who was here and what they did in order to determine if something was um, carved geologic process or not. Right. So it's a very curious thing to me. Very closed off system here with this stuff. Mm, yeah. Well, and, and you know, I mean some markings on the coast are just some of the strange things revolved around water that we're going to be getting into here. I mean, Wait, we... talking about water, <laughs> right, right, right. I uh, thought we're but... talking about Gungan cities. <laughs> <laughs> we should be for those of you that don't know the Gungan cities are these cities that were in star Wars. I think it was the, the ones that appeared at uh... Jar Jar Binks. Yeah. Oh, that was the worst. Yeah, oh, yeah, gosh, they've failed so hard on star Wars, but anyway, these cities that were, you know, under the ocean and in these sort of like, they kind of like bubble, like 
bubbles, Enhanced right? Where, bubble technology. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know, some real stuff we found under the water. One of the things that I really wanted to ask you about was this antikytheria um, mechanism. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And, and they say that it is the earliest computer known. Um, and, and it predicts astronomical positions and eclipses. Have you guys viewed this, yeah. John? Like, what is this thing? No, it is. It is exactly that prediction prediction mechanism, basically. That does. It's it was meant to predict exactly what people think it was for, um, and navigation purposes. So this but, was in a ship, and it was it was used in navigation purposes while out at sea. Right. Yes. Yes, in general, but this is not a technology that was created by the people who were using it. As really? far as what we've seen with remote viewing, this was something older, something something from another era, another age. So, so that, yeah, it was not it was not something that people knew how to create. It was just like something that somebody had carried down. It was like in the data, it was like like passed from father to son, father to son, kind of sort situation. Hmm. So, and, yeah, I know. And it's a really fascinating device. It is. And it looks like it's made out of metal and yet was resistant to um, rust and and wear more than other metals in the ocean somehow. Right. And this because, is one of those out of place parts. Yeah. I mean, if, if you know, if the if the skyscrapers in New York were under sea for like. Uh, less than a thousand years they'd probably be totally decimated gone nearly you know right right i mean there's tons of these out of place parts um across the world i mean look at the baghdad battery you know the baghdad battery i've heard of that before it was found they think it's about a two thousand year old battery well that's the theory um a lot of people don't believe that anthropologists archaeologists some do, some don't. They were these clay jars that um, had iron rods in them, uh, and and they could produce about a volt of electricity, hmm. right? And when we looked at what they were constructed for, they used them for um, uh, electrotherapy, medical device. Uh, it was a medical device specifically, and they used it to. I mean, you know, like electricity. In, in in healthcare, in medical treatment was something that that w was played with a lot in the early 1900s. I mean, even Edgar Casey and his, you know, the sleeping prophet and his sure. in his work talked a lot about people using the violet ray, which shoots high amounts of electricity into them to to, I don't know, cure disease and whatnot. But this is the same concept, same concept. And 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 whomever back back way back when in, in Baghdad. I guess that's where they found them, um, used this stuff and knew about using electricity to help with ailments. There's a lot of out of place parts. I mean, I don't know. I guess this is kind of an out of place part, sort of, you know, the million year old bridge in, um, it's called Adam's bridge. This is a really interesting one. I've in never heard about this. What's this Adam's bridge. So this is in, this is between India and Sri Lanka. So according to ancient Indian legend, like coming from ancient, like Vedic texts, we're talking about stuff that's, that's way prehistory. Yeah. Adam's bridge. So, so in these legends, King Rama, um, an Indian King built a bridge between India and Sri Lanka more than a million years ago. So it's said in these texts and, this, like from satellite photos, you can see remnants of a bridge that goes from India to Sri Lanka. Now, the former director of the Geological Survey of India took samples of it, and he found that there were stones that were basically placed on top of a marine sand layer, which he said that can't happen. So these had to have been placed there, right? So wait, wait, how old? So how long is this bridge? Do we know? How many miles I'm not is it? Sure, how many miles it is? It's pretty long. It's pretty long. But the the story is is that King Rama had uh, people his people create this bridge so he can connect the two lands. A million. 
How I don't know if that's true. A million years, who knows? But you know, and it's 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 pretty long. It's it's quite a distance. Thirty miles is what I'm getting. Yeah, thirty miles. There that's you go. A long bridge, man. But see, here's the thing. Here's the funny thing about this is that you know these ancient texts that are that come out of India. I, I look to them quite a bit because now not all of it, but some of it is actually related to historical events and not, you know, metaphorical. Made up fantasy. Accounts. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yet nobody really looks at this as being um, uh, something that you can actually get information from. But even the even the director of the U.S. or the, the Geological Survey of India found that these this had to be constructed. But, you know. Not but they're go not going them. to be trusted because what? They're not American. <laughs> they're not American. But well, it, it it goes back to verifying that ancient text, ancient Indian texts, were actually historical documents, and that's not a thing that they want to verify. Of course, it's just not because that there's so much crazy stuff in there, like Dwarka, the lost underwater city. Right? Um, tell, tell me about Dwarka. Dwarka, Dwarka was was a legend that came out of um, two, uh, I think, the old Vedic texts. One of those was the Mahabharata, where it's the epic battle between the uh, these two cousins. Uh, that that was kind of like the marker for the turning of the age between like the Dwapara Yuga and the Kali Yuga, which we're in now, according to the Indians. It's like the cyclical time frame of ages. And, and Dwarka, Dwar okay, so Dwarka in the Mahabharata and another text was, was said to be flooded or it was about to be flooded. And Krishna basically was the ruler of Dwarka, the blue being Krishna. And, and Krishna left after the Mahabharata war before the turn of the age to the Kali Yuga to go back to where he came from. And then the city got flooded, all right? And he warned everybody, and this was in the Mahabharata and other texts, that the city was going to be flooded. Now, cut to the 1950s or so, 1940s maybe, the Indians found um, a city underwater where it was described to be in the Mahabharata, right? And, so and in an underwater city? Yeah, it got flooded. It got flooded. And, oh, 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 okay. And covered but it, in water, right? right. Okay. So. So what we're talking about is like at the turn of the age from the uh, Dwapari Yuga to the Kali Yuga, there was a cataclysm hmm. as there are between these ages. And, and, and that city, that location was flooded. And we find this, you know, uh, you know, the Black Sea was or the Mediterranean Sea was created as well. A large part of it was created. It's likely that the, the, uh, the Azores, like in the Azores where Atlantis could have been, was above water and then flooded as well. So there was a big cataclysm at the turning of the ages. And that's when, when um, Krishna left, right? So now here's the thing with these documents. It's like Adam's bridge. It's like, like they're in these documents and then later on these things are found. And if, if it's kind of like what we were talking about in one of the previous episodes where you're talking about like the Chinese referencing like the Anunnaki here, right? Yeah. You go back to these ancient documents and then you can you can potentially find the physical remnants of what they were talking about. Right. And this happens all the time, especially with these ancient texts coming out of China, probably, but definitely coming out of India, definitely coming out of India. And you want to get into some weird stuff and you're talking about Krishna. I mean, that that blue being we've seen in other parts of the universe when we remote view other planets, it's like. It's an alien in a sense, right? God, yeah, like a different type, like that, right? an Anunnaki or something like that, right? right? Who knows? Right. So there's like these other cultures of, of beings that are interacting with earth humans, you know? Yeah. And, and so many of the ancient Indian paintings have these blue beings that look it's, like humans, but they're blue. It's Where a did race. It come from? Yeah. Right. It's a race. Were they, I, you know, I always wondered, were they seeing them with their celestial eyes you know was it like or were they here they're physical right they're physical from what from what we've seen we've seen them a lot in the vega vega star solar system well and and you know 
uh, yeah. And, and whenever anyone brings up Vega, everyone always describes it as this like bluish purple planet or something like that. Maybe that's something to it. I don't know. Like that's just pure speculation right i don't know if they're from there or not i just know that we see them when we go there you know like remote viewing describes things it sure. doesn't name it right so so we just get descriptions of things we don't get the the human level concepts about those things right yeah it's right it's it's like right it's non crystallized information right right yeah exactly yeah but anyway i mean we're talking about water here so i don't know <laughs> what's next time well i just think this dwarka is an interesting concept you know like oh this... well, yeah dwarka was like was okay so right now there's an aspect of dwarka that sits right on the coast in india and they found this in the gulf of cambay or just outside the gulf of cambay that is just off the coast from the the, the current city of dwarka um and that city is one of the Ho most holiest pilgrimage sites that that Indians will will go to to take. And it's got so many legends around it that Krishna ruled it and it was the seat of power um, um, and all that stuff. And so they found found remnants of this underwater and they did some carbon dating on some. I mean, it controversial. This is all really controversial sure. carbon dating on on some of the items found there. And it was it was, I think, 9000 years old, at least. 9,000 years old, right. but the carbon dating is, is obviously really contentious in the scientific circles. And as far as I know, the Indian government shut down, um, research into the site for maybe they were getting the too much heat 10 years or so. Well, the thing is, is that I don't think they want to bring, um, a focus to these ancient Indian texts relating to physical stuff, physical historic stuff, because, because the world has been taken over by this smithsonian idea right you know don't look at things that go beyond a certain time frame maybe maybe not i mean it seems to me that a lot of this stuff is abandoned um because of that that statement that they made mm. right hmm well you know okay so a couple of things john um <clears throat> a few years back i started researching the mariana trench uh because i was curious the fact that the in entirety of Mount Everest can fit in that part of the ocean, like the height. You, you, it, it literally thousands of, of feet away from even peeking over that part of the ocean. Right. So that part of the ocean goes so deep. And uh, James Cameron had developed a submarine that could reach down there, you know, I guess to just do some research. I don't know. But I saw some infographics that were, <laughs> were pur purporting alleging that he was looking for a, a gate down there or something like that. Right. Uh, you know, and I asked you to remote view it. And what did you, what did you find? That he was, he was in a process of, you know, trying to find anything that was um, unknown, basically trying to make new discoveries and for the basic adventure of it. Um, but we didn't necessarily see him coming into anything that was incredible and fascinating. Awesome. And you have to think about, you know, the size of the Mariana Trench it, and <laughs> where you end up when you get to the bottom. Utter um, darkness. Yeah, and, and it's a very barren landscape when you get down there um, in general, devoid of most of life, except for these like little shrimp that, that, that have aluminum, metal, like they have a metal in a sense, gel gelatinous metal shell around them because in order to protect themselves from the immense pressure down there, right? Because otherwise they'd get crushed. They, they, they basically take sand um, that's got aluminum in it. It's on the bottom of the bottom. trench and they digest that and it goes into this shell layer around them that protects them from the pressure. And so they exist on the bottom, like sitting there, like at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. But that whole area is like, you know, it's where the plates meet and they're just like, there's a lot of vol volcanic activity and a lot of weird stuff going on down there um, as far as springs and whatnot go. But the, the, the pressure is so immense, so immense that it can crush, uh, can literally crush you. And I know that he had problems with his his um, gear when he went down there because you just don't know what's going to happen because of the immense pressure. I think it's like, 
from I don't know how how much more pressure down there than yeah, than seven sea miles level. down. Yeah, it's huge. it's huge. But now we didn't really see that he came across anything okay, um, so interesting. Have you seen the movie Pacific Rim? Oh yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All right. So in Pacific Rim, basically in the Mariana Trench it's it's you know obviously it's a fictional story there you know it's where the plates meet and the plates have electro uh, electricity with the water somehow creates a portal where things can come through and these kaiju come through right that that are these big monsters like godzilla type monsters that start attacking cities and they have to create robots basically to 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 battle these crazy beasts. Yeah. Have you seen anything like that happening anywhere okay. on the planet? I got to ask. All right. So, okay. So this is weird. Okay. I, that's exactly what I want to hear. <laughs> I remember hearing or no, I remember reading, there was like some channeler person and they were talking about how whales go through this portal um, and they travel around through a portal into another rendition of earth and they'll come back and they'll utilize this, this portal that's under the ocean to come and go um, from this other rendition of earth. Right. And I thought that was a really interesting thing because whales are incredible and they're incredible to remote view in general. So I don't normally task remote viewers on channeled information in general. That's like a, a rule that I have, but I did task remote viewers on the reality of there being some type of portal under the ocean that whales will traverse. And yes, that was all like, it was like lining up perfectly with what this channeler had said that, that there is this very, I don't know where it would be. I honestly don't know where it would be, but deep, deep, deep underwater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Exactly. Up whales <laughs> flying through space and time. There, deep, deep underwater, there is this like, like, I don't know what it is. It's like a gateway. It's like, uh, it's an area where there's a, a lot of energy. It could be something related to the to Mariana okay. Trench, potentially electromagnetic energy that's creating a rift where where they can move in and out of it and it goes to what was described as a very much more pristine earth like in a dimensional construct and that they can traverse that barrier go through it go over there and then come back through the portal to this earth i mean it was weird data right so i'm like i'm like and we did this in a different way than like on paper yeah. remote viewing sessions. This was done in, in what we call image streaming, where there's a group of us, group image streaming, where there's a group of us remote viewing it. Everybody's blind. They don't know what they're viewing, remote viewing, but they're using a different methodology and interacting with each other as they're viewing this thing. And that's, that's, that's what it was, which is really fascinating to me. I mean, I didn't know what to do with it. It was just sort of like something fun to do, but it came up with some interesting data around it. Yeah. So and you will think about it though, man, like, Okay, so Montauk and 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 super collider type right. technology. Right. What are they doing? They're trying to open a doorway to like like at least an in between world, in between dimensions. You know, I mean, that's what we've seen in the data. That's what people have written books about. That's what they've accomplished. This stuff also exists naturally. I don't doubt that for a second. Right? This stuff exists naturally because yeah. they're trying to emulate something. Right. You know. So I don't doubt for a second that there are these things under the water as there are on land. You want to hear something crazy? Yeah. The, the scary version of that? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever researched eels, John? No, I haven't. So on one of our uh, series on Rise TV, I think it was called, uh, what was it? The C C it was called The Seas. Uh, one of these episodes, you know, we, we were... We were innocently looking for the Loch Ness monster, and we came across the craziest data on eels of anything I think I've ever researched on an animal on the planet. And it was very similar to what you just described with whales. One of the things that has baffled scientists since the beginning, they cannot figure out how eels procreate. Oh, they started finding that all of the eels 
and correct me, Lindsay, if I'm wrong here, all of the eels end up traveling to an area in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> they all go there. They all know to go there. And then somehow new eels come out, but there is no mating process that that creates the eels. And people have, have, of course, the craziest ideas have come out of this, that, they, that they're somehow coming out of some type of portal over there. And think about how an eel looks. It looks straight out of hell. Oh, eels yeah. are evil looking i mean yeah and that's one type one type of eel right yeah wow you know i honestly like the more that i begin to understand through remote viewing of course which doesn't hold up in a court of law in the least bit <laughs> the more that the more that i like embark on these projects of of strange creatures the more that we find that a lot of them in our legends somehow sniff out somehow have some genetic capability to sniff out these locations where they can traverse the dimensions, right? Where they can exist in both worlds going back and forth. And, and I think that this is the case with a lot of these beings and eels definitely could be part of that. Well, and, and, and think eels, like some of them are electric, electric eels. They generate electricity. Who knows what that does to them or how it actually um, affects them and their entire bodies. I mean, this is a mysterious thing that the e eels are such a strange conversation. And it's just one of the weird things going on in the ocean that we don't even know about that. No one's really researching that much. It's just confusion. And the fact that that stuff happens in the Bermuda Triangle, that the eels are going there. I mean, it just adds to the bizarre, you know, theories revolved around the Bermuda Triangles that no one, the Bermuda Triangle, that no one can really uh, you know, no one understands. I mean, then there is the the stuff that like in this episode on Rise.tv, we we were looking into these psychic octopuses. So you heard all about this. We've I oh, think yeah. we even talked about this in another episode where octopuses were tested. And um, I think it was what the Spanish um, it was some world. It was like the World Cup. And yeah. they they had like the different the different teams that were playing in the World Cup. The octopus would always choose the team that was going to win the World I Cup. Think his name was Paul. Or his something. name was Paul. I know I made fun of this so bad. Why would you name that guy Paul, right? But octopus are really bizarre because not just the they can squeeze through anything. They're they're the thing of nightmares. They have more brain power than almost anything on the planet. Multiple brains, in fact. Like their their tentacles are brains in and of themselves. They look kind of like brains in a really weird way, and they're conscious and and evil, and they can get out of almost anything. Wait, they, they're they're conscious and evil? Is that what you said? They're, they're just but they're like of course they're conscious, but I just mean they're like they're. <laughs> They're just over. I don't know. There's something really b bizarre. Like they're the smartest guy in the room and no one knows it. And they can get out of almost any like situation using yeah. their bizarre bodies. They're terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I they're, they're uh, fascinating creatures. I, I scuba dive a lot. Used to go scuba diving a ton, a ton, a ton. And, and I would have uh, interactions with octopus sometimes, you know, I mean, they would, they, they hide a lot, but they're just incredible yeah, creatures. I would just love to watch them, you know, like growing up on Jacques Cousteau and stuff. It's like the under oh, dude. Yeah. That's it. We got to get into the Jacques Cousteau story. You found what's going oh, on, man. Jacques Cousteau. Oh, you know, I don't know if the story's true or not. But it has been said that in the 1970s, Jacques Cousteau um, went to Lake Tahoe. Now, this is highly contested. <clears throat> he may not have done this. <clears throat> it could have been somebody close to him. It could have been somebody totally different. <clears throat> but apparently, you know, this, the legend around this is that Jacques Cousteau went, took a sub in the 1970s in Lake Tahoe. Um, and because it's 1,600 feet deep. It's a alpine lake at like 6,000 feet above sea level. And it's like the second deepest lake in the United States. <clears throat> so he took a sub down. He comes back up. He doesn't have any footage. And he says, the world's not ready to know what's down there. So that's the story of it. Now, 
That's weird, right? That's a weird thing because Lake Tahoe has a lot of mystery around it in general. I mean, the, the native population around there uh, throughout their legends have said that there's a creature that lives in the lake and kind of like lock, like lock. Yeah. Lake. Like they call it, call it Tahoe Tessie. Huh. The other weird thing about Lake Tahoe is that, um, well, this is like with any very, very cold lake, the surface temperature varies quite a bit, you know, but when you get down to the lower depths of the lake, it's going to be consistent, uh, in the 30 degree Fahrenheit mark, right? That's quite cold. That's quite cold. So what happens if you drown in that lake is that when a body, when a, when a body dies in the water, it sinks. The first thing it does is it sinks. And then as the body starts to decay, it fills with gases and then it floats back to the surface. Now, what happens in Lake Tahoe is that it will sink, but it'll hit that 30 degree mark and it'll stay perfectly preserved, will not begin to break down and will not float back to the surface. So the, 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 the legends around this is that in the, you know, 1930s, forties, whatever the, the mob is going to say was throwing bodies in there um, as well as other people. And they just are hovering in a zone like, I don't know, 200 to 600 feet down or so. Right because they just sink and they go down there. And occasionally you hear the story, I don't know if they're true or not, of somebody washing up in Victorian clothes because of currents, bring them back up, right? So I don't know if they're true or not. Victorian clothes? Yeah, Victorian clothes. So there's a lot of weird stuff around that lake. Now, when we remote viewed, what's in the lake? Like, what is that statement? Whether Jacques Cousteau said it or somebody else said it or not, I have no idea. But looking around, like, what is that statement? You know, what's it about? What's in the lake? We okay, say we, we got, for one I'm thing, we got so excited right now. <laughs> we got tunnels and we got caves under, under this lake that lead to other bodies of water, right? And so there's there's pressure and equalization occurring between this lake and other bodies of water. Now, one of the things that happens in that lake, if you're not careful, is that if you're in a certain area where pressure is equalizing, water pressure is equalizing, you're going to get sucked. You're going to get sucked into something else. Sure. Right? Now, some people claim that that lake connects to Pyramid Lake but I highly doubt it. I think it wait, connects. Wait, where's Pyramid Lake? Is that another Pyramid place? Pyramid Lake is like, it's it's down in the Nevada, on the Nevada side, down in the desert, which is about 3,000 feet below. And I don't necessarily think that it's connected to Pyramid Lake through these um, tunnels, but maybe it is. Heck, I don't know. I do know that water's equalizing, and I do know that some of the disappearances, like for instance, a scuba diver, um, uh, disappeared. They found him 17 years later wow. in the lake, just, just hovering in a zone, but he was getting sucked down because of, of water pulling as it's like, you know, it's kind of like the blue hole in Belize. You don't go into the blue hole of Belize because you're going to get sucked in into it and then deposited somewhere else after you drown because of the way the currents and pressure is equalizing this, this happens in Lake Tahoe. Um, now, as far as that statement is concerned though, wasn't about that. It wasn't about tunnels and pressure equalization, nor was it about bodies floating. It was about a sea monster, literally a sea monster that lives in that lake and then goes through these tunnels, tubes, probably lava. Dude, tubes. this is a horror movie. This is a horror movie. Yeah, right. This and is like a, the Swamp Man or something. Like, this is like the Swamp Man, but it's not the Swamp Man necessarily. It's probably a pleosaur. So it's probably so like, a, Loch, so like Loch Ness. So like Ness. Like Loch Ness. Yeah, it's it's most likely a pleosaur. How is um, this thing still alive, bro? Well, this is the thing. I think that that we just we deny these things because we think we have we know everything that's out there, right? We know everything that's out there. Heck, if we didn't know everything that was out there. Um, I mean, it just can't exist, right? We, if, if, if we don't know that it's out there, then it just doesn't exist. That's all there is to it. And so those things are extinct, according to modern science. 
they, but the thing with water is that we, we, we can't reach these places. It's dark to us. We can't reach a lot of these places unless we're talking about, you know, military and classified operations under the ocean, which they probably know. I mean, who, who explores the ocean and underwater places more than the militaries of the, the Navy? World? Yeah. I mean, they got to know what's going on down there, all the different creatures that are down there in general. I mean, we as humans, the ocean is like space to us, mm. where to, to the militaries, it's not. I mean, the, o the ocean is something that they know so much more about and is probably classified than we can ever possibly imagine. And I do think that there's a lot of pleosaurs left over that are still in existence. I, I really do. And I think that they do exist in some of these lakes after they've been cut off, like um, Champ, Champy over in Champlain. You know, Lake, Champlain. Lake Champlain. There's a plesiosaur there too. Yeah, there is. There is. Now we've remote viewed some of these like pictures of Loch Ness and Champy and stuff. Actually, one picture that we found of Champy was a total fake. I mean, people yeah. will just construct these things and then they'll be posited as I took a picture of Champy and everybody's jumping on it. This is incredible. But no, uh -uh. a lot of them are faked because people think it's funny when um, they get other people to believe that something is real when they think it's not. So it's a, I think it's a sad state of affairs for humans in general when they do I, stuff like that. But It is in general just because how do we find new species when everything is – there's so many stories that you and I have been going through lately on land, in sea, of different things that are unexplained that no one wants to talk about. Right, right. Well, I mean even water in general, you know? I mean – Yeah, look water. at that. Uh, washed up on shore somewhere. Where was this, Lindsay? Georgia. Hard to, know, hard to know the context of that. Yeah. Like what's what, – how big is that? It's a good question. Not that big, it doesn't look like. No, it doesn't. They think it's a shark, think it's a shark. but they call everything a shark, dude. Everything yeah. is called a shark when they don't know what it is. Or a chupacabra. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Right. Man, yeah, that's so interesting. I feel like the Loch Ness monster or these plesiosaurus characters are like the Bigfoot of the sea. For the most part and they're, right. they're found in multiple places in lakes and in in canada and the united states scotland right. i mean many sightings of these things and there's there's pretty fantastic evidence of these things more than was even a, a several years ago when these kind of myths came out and the fact that alistair crowley would buy a home on loch ness just because who knows why, but that's when the yeah. appearances started happening soon after that. Oh, no. Are you saying he opened up a portal? I'm not. I don't know, John. <laughs> I'm just saying the appearances started soon after. Man, you know, Crowley who knows? There. Everybody knows this guy's whole goal in life was trying to open a portal somewhere. Who knows? Right. The guy was psycho. Right, right, right. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, he could have. <laughs> weird stuff. Weird stuff. Well, we're running out of time with this episode, and we're about to get into some of the craziest stories we found on the seas in our next episode. So please join us uh, for that. And uh, yeah, John, did you have anything else to add? No, I'm good. <laughs> well, you guys, I uh, hope you thought this show was as out of this world as we did, and uh, we'll see you guys soon on the next episode of The Seas here and Metaphysical.